a few weeks later, uh, we'd seen one another on another demonstration. We'd seen the same group of people. So I think they were trying to get other people to come on this thing, whatever it was. He then said, well, it's going to be under the LAIU, which is the Animal Liberation Investigation Unit. So he said, right, well, this is what we want you to do. You've got to catch a train. You can't talk to anybody. No one can meet up, you know, until we get to the train station. So basically, that's what we did. We got there. I can't really remember how we got there, but we did get there. Well, I got there. Um, I think it was in a in a VW uh, camper van. And, uh, oh, my dear Jesus, what a place. And it was just as I remembered. The thought of just being able to give the creatures a runaround, the, the beagles a runaround, was a lovely prospect, you know, just to be able to give them that. And so we basically, I couldn't get into the compound because it was all wire. Angie and others got up onto the roof and they dropped a banner with boots, torture beagles. There was other people inside the compound letting the beagles out to just run about, not freely, but just to give them the space they needed spend a bit of time with them, hug them, hold them. Um, and then other people got into the units, um, the offices, and they, the staff locked themselves in. And then the others, which was me, stayed outside. And basically what we did was we formed a human chain. And a lot of those were women. We formed a human chain together. And each, basically all paperwork that was to be taken was to be given back. Um, it wasn't to be stolen, but to be given back. And it, at that time, the law allowed you to do that. If you weren't going to deprive the company permanently of that, then it was fine. You weren't. You couldn't be prosecuted. We thought we'll do what we can. Oh God, it was such hard work. You know, lifting the boxes, lifting the paperwork, trying to get as much stuff as we could in while all these dogs were barking and the chaos and the smell of who we not just us um, and you know just everything really just the whole whole couple of hours where all of a sudden these police came out of nowhere and i mean there was a lot of police it was a helicopter police guard dogs it was just a din an absolute din and my boyfriend at the time he'd got paperwork in his rucksack and he was on a motorbike well he'd gone um but they put a cordon i think about a five mile cordon around the whole place and it was huge it was just a huge amount of police and they said you're going nowhere nobody's going anywhere how many activists were there do you think there was 43 activists in total, maybe a few more that were on the kind of perimeter waiting for paperwork to be got out so they could give it to the media. Um, but there was 43 of us in total. I did what I, I could do and I worked very hard along with everybody else. Everybody had a part to play, but I was very glad to be there, Pamela. I was very, very glad. I was very proud of us all. You know, and, and I know it was very nerve wracking uh, and it was not an easy thing to take part in. Certainly from my point of view, I've gone from going to animal aid in Kidderminster to finding myself in the middle of nowhere at a laboratory, having bre broken into that laboratory or helping to facilitate that and try and help those around me to try and to have the confidence to know what I was doing and, and understand the implications of what that truly meant, uh, which obviously came later. And this is where I think your activism does massively play a part in what courage levels you are going to have, because uh, it's only when you're sat in a police station do you start to understand what some of that implication means and that's that's on another level completely but nevertheless it was a very positive day uh, and there was great solidarity 
with all of us. Um, but unfortunately, um, the police had all the paperwork. They arrested every single person. They found every single person. There wasn't one piece of that paperwork that got out to the press, which was the very reason why we'd gone and done it. Everybody was told not to take any animals from there um, because this was solely a press situation to give the maximum um, press coverage uh, to, you know, to whoever wanted the information that we'd got. And had that information been got out, I believe, then it would have completely and utterly blown the whole thing with boots wide apart. I mean, as it happened, it did anyway, because there was a big raid on Boots uh, laboratory where beagles were taken. It was a, definitely a, a company that was under a lot of pressure. You were arrested and you ended up sitting in the police station. Yes. Right. Yes. And when you were sitting there in the police station, this sort of like young woman, it was your first sort of like, you know. It was, yeah. I mean, what were you thinking? Because it's um, terrifying. I, I actually felt, um, I felt quite scared. I felt quite scared. Uh, if you want my honest opinion, I could make it sound more ballsier, but I'm afraid I didn't feel like that. I felt quite scared of it. Um, but at the same time, I felt I'd done the right thing. So it was a real mix of emotions. And I felt worried about everybody else as well. Some people were much better at it than than a lot of other people were. Um, you know, those that had been around the movement for quite some time were walked it, you know, they were not shaken by it at all because they were doing raids all the time, breaking the law all the time. And they were really confident in what they were doing. But for a first time offence, uh, the gravitas was huge. Um, and I, I, I'm not understating that. It was, it was big for me. But having said that, I, I wanted more of it, you know. I wanted to expose what was going on. And there was a massive part of me that was immensely proud of everybody and, and, and immensely proud of myself because it's very easy. You could just sit at home and not take part in it or say to yourself, well, actually, you know, I do want to take part. And I think this is where my activism from speaking to people at a stall, you know, and being positive and um, fed through to me sitting in that police station, feeling exactly the same. I felt very positive about what I'd done, but I felt scared as well at the same time. But equally, I was glad because I thought, well, you know, who else is going to do this? How are we going to expose this if people like ourselves don't expose it? You know, don't push ourselves into uncomfortable areas of our lives. Uh, you know, and it was no risk to me to sit in a police station. The only time I felt really scared of it, I think, was when uh, we'd had extensive CID um, brought us into each, each room and they questioned us for quite a while and that that for the first time ever I'd never been in a room never been anywhere near any police officer CID were there and they were asking loads of questions and I made no comment all the way through I thought no uh you know I'm just staying quiet and so I did I did say I was proud of what I did I did say to them I was proud of what I did Oh, you're proud, are you? And I said, yes, I'm very proud, very proud, and I'm very proud of anyone here, everybody here. Oh, are you? Yes. Have you got anything else to say? No, no comment, no reply. And that's how it stayed all the way through. So I then started to think to myself, what else is now going to happen? And we were there for hours and hours and hours, and some of the Different people from the, the, the one police station. There was too many activists for one police station to deal with. So they decided to split the women up and the men up. And different people went to different places. Some people ended up in gyms. Some people ended up at the police station. Three or four women that I was with ended up at a women's prison. 
the holding cells at a women's prison. And we all went in a cell van from, from there, which was a huge vehicle with individual cells. And we were handcuffed and our shoes were taken and all that. And we were then taken to court the following morning in a cell van from the women's prison. So you got a big door in front of you and they slid it open and you were already inside there and with your hands cuffed, waiting. Um, but I still managed to do that. So, to you, the camp. so you were held overnight? Yes, you were certainly getting on for nearly a day, day and a half to two days. Yeah. What about your mum and your dad? Were oh, they gosh. Oh, they were going, oh, we knew this. We knew. <laughs> We knew you were going to do this. You just haven't stopped. Since you started, you haven't stopped. You know, the bedroom was a shrine to animal rights. There was gory posters everywhere. There was a huge, huge poster up on my ceiling of my bedroom with two drays, rabbits, drays, which were, it was to do with animal testing where you put stuff in their eyes. And then a whole list of animal products that have been used. It was a huge, bat, you know, huge poster. And it was on my ceiling. And my dad said, could that poster be any bigger? And I said, I know it's great, isn't it? I got it from the animal aid office. Help myself to it because they didn't want it. No, we've used it. Great, I'll have it. So every horrific picture was up there known to man you know there was there wasn't one you know it was either burnt rabbit burnt beagle slaughtered this don't test on that and that was my room it was a shrine and so i used to go to sleep with those posters and wake up thinking what can i do today how can i help what can we do the house was full of animals then you know we had lots of creatures and many of those were rescued. We were totally immersed in animal rights at that point. My father was well used to it. He used to just go, oh God, what what's she got into now? You know, what is she doing? You know, and it was always like that. Well, so when did she get arrested then? Oh, the other, oh, the other day, all oh, right. When she due in court then? And it was like that, that's how it was. You know, and if it wasn't me, it was my mother, you know. And it, so it was like that, you know, and even my brother got involved in it, you know. So it was like a proper family affair. It was nuts. It was a wonderful environment, but nevertheless, it was still very worrying. And at that point, um, we didn't know that we weren't going to get remanded, actually. We'd been told we could be remanded in custody because the um, charges were so serious. Um, they amounted to conspiracy to for theft and burglary criminal damage it was as serious as it could get that was my very first arrestable offense what was the chat like in the cell between yourself and the other sort of like women that you were locked up with were, were they sort of like you know were you all kind of supporting each other or were people sort of like panicking or no i mean some people were panicking some people were quiet some people didn't say anything because there'd been a raid on the laboratory a week before. So who they were looking for were the same activists that were involved in this. So most of us were just quiet, really. Most of us just listened to what was being said, watching people going backwards and forwards, being interviewed by the CID. We just kind of all sat quite quietly. There were big kind of cells at the police station where they would have like, because really you're not really supposed to be all lumped in together like that, but they really didn't have a choice. So the women that knew one another quite well just just let it ride over their heads. It, you know, I, I was probably more quiet. Angie was very attentive. She she asked how I was, are you okay? And and uh, yeah, and I was I was I was fine. There were other women who I was with another woman who, who, who wasn't very good at all. She just wanted to get home. Her creatures were at home and she thought everything was fine. But then we started hearing, and this caused real alarm. 
real alarm for me. They started lifting animals from people's homes. Oh, no. And, yeah, and that was really, really difficult to hear. And I said, is that a rumour? And they went, no, no. They started lifting because they think we might have some of the animals from the boots raid from the week before. And I went, holy fuck, you're joking. I went, no. And one of her uh, creatures had been lifted. Um, they were a couple of rats. And she went bananas. She went absolutely fucking bananas. And I had to really calm her down, as well as calming myself down. Because uh, I had to then think clearly about what was happening at home. So I banged on the bars and said, excuse me, I need to speak, I need to ring my mum and dad. We were only allowed one phone call. Yeah, 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 I know I'm only allowed one phone call. I mean, we even had a policewoman follow us into the loos. That's how bad it was, you know, just to go for a piss. And I said, you don't have to actually follow me into the toilet, you know. And she said, well, I'm afraid we do. Under these charges, I'm afraid we do. And so anyway, I managed to get to the phone and I managed to do a message to my mum and dad, which they got, thank fuck. Um, poor mum, she was trying to work out what I was trying to say. And suffice to say that, you know, everything was fine, that the animals we had were fine because we had good friends. Um, uh, so they've started lifting. Oh, right, OK. And, and, and uh, But I didn't say that because they were all in the room. Do you know those leaflets that you got last week? Yes. Can you make sure that they get posted tomorrow? Tomorrow. Yes. Yes. I think I know what you mean. Good. Good. And then that was it. Have you finished the phone call? They took the phone off me and put and said thank you and put the phone down. And I went back to the cell and I just hoped, fingers crossed, that everything was going to be okay. And they were here in the morning. They went upstairs and they took stuff from my bedroom. They went through everything. They said, oh, she's, you know, she's done a very serious thing. And, she, you know, there's 43 people being caught up in this. And, you know, and there was all boards underneath the stairs at the time with a poster, which was hilarious, that Paul had given me. And it was a poster of these houses in a street with grey roofs. But the one house had a purple roof, like an outsider. And he was being taken in a police van. Anyway, the copper came underneath the stairs and he said, do you think we're as bad as that, do you? And my mum said, well, that, that's a question of opinion, isn't it? He said, uh, are all these boards hers? She said, no, they're mine. And he went, oh, you're into this as well, are you? And she said, you're damn right. Yeah. And he said, right. He said, you do realise that your daughter's been charged with some serious offences? Yeah, I'm pretty much aware of that because you're standing in my hallway. And uh, that's how she answered them. And uh, he said, uh, right, I've got to go up to your daughter's bedroom. Fucking hell. The shrine, the shrine that it was to animal rights, you know. I could not get away with not thinking I wasn't sympathetic. He opened the door and it was like, boom, 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 boom. You know, bum, 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 bum. So animal rights everywhere. And so they went through everything. They collated everything. They took stuff. I was still at the police station, still there, uh, still waiting around. We'd been taking it. I mean, the cell vans, there was two, two, two cell vans. They were big cell vans, you know, with these little seats in them and little black windows. And we were banging on the windows, you know, you can only see out, but no one can see in. And um, so we went to the courts and we weren't remanded in custody, but I think John was remanded in custody for eight weeks. We had to wait around. We had to sign stuff to make sure we weren't going to abscond. We weren't going to do this. We weren't going to do that. We couldn't talk to anybody else. We, could go, we couldn't go outside any research establishment within the UK. We couldn't go in, in any boots whatsoever across the UK. All of that was very tight. 
and that went on for over a year. We were waiting for it to go to Crown Court. You weren't allowed to talk to anyone else. What do you mean exactly? No, it, the, basically anybody who you've been arrested with, you couldn't speak to them. You couldn't converse with them at all. Not it, for the whole time. You had nothing to do. That, that was part of the agreement that you you said, right, okay, I won't talk. I mean, people obviously did talk because who the fuck's going to police that? Well, but yeah. yeah, quite. But nevertheless, though that it was very very tight bail restrictions. So we understood if we we if we were to break that, then obviously we'd we'd be back in we'd be in prison, uh, and they made no bones about that. So that's what everybody decided to do. I think most people just wanted to get home to make sure that everything was okay back at home. Uh, I don't think anyone was particularly bothered or frightened about going to court or even being jailed. I think what they initially wanted to do was get home to just make sure that everything was where it was meant to be, such as animals, such as cats and dogs and, and, and partners and all that, you know, to make sure that everybody was okay. That's really the only worry a lot of people actually did have. So that was a definite kind of learning experience for me. I learned solidarity. I learned how to control my own fears in that sense of being in a police environment, knowing, listening to people around me who knew more than I did. You know, not to speak to the police, to just hold your tongue. Don't drop anybody else in it. There were people keeping an eye definitely on younger people such as myself. And it was okay to feel a mixed bag of emotion. I actually helped the woman that was in my cell very much. I put myself on the back burner and helped her. Um, which was very adult of me at that time to do. I didn't have to do that. It would have been very easy to fall to pieces and get really frightened. But no, if anything, I felt emboldened to get the help or get somebody to say, excuse me, I need to speak to somebody. Or well, you grew up very quickly in that moment. You kind of felt much more adult. You know, um, I didn't feel like a young you know, young woman in that sense, I felt more like I am the activist now that I, I am. Um, I, I can feel that coming out in me, um, that I've got more to offer. Um, I've got more to do. It sounds almost like it was a transformative experience. That yeah, that it was. Whole thing, almost like it was your initiation in yeah, I think another it, realm of being. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd say that was pretty... That's a pretty honest thing to say. Um, I, I did feel like that, actually. Yeah, yeah, I did feel. Uh, I felt nervous. I felt scared. I felt elated. I felt proud. I felt, I felt good. I felt alive. I felt like I was doing something positive for the animals, positive for everyone around me. And I wanted the truth to get out. I wanted the truth to get out to the ordinary members of the public, the very people that I'd spoken to at that stall in Birmingham and all over the UK, you know, when we used to go off and do stalls everywhere. Yeah, I wanted the public to know because I was a member of the public too. I wasn't just an activist. I was a member of the public. I'm an ordinary person. And the horror of people walking in to a lovely boots store, pharmacy that smells beautiful and looks lovely with lovely people behind the counters all pushing their lovely makeups and their bubble bars and their, their tablets and their cough medicines. Yeah, that horrified me that I thought, oh my God, people are going in there and they have no idea of what's going on. And yeah, I wanted to expose that to them. I wanted to say, hey, this group of people, they're liars. And how, how big is the lie out there? If this is a lie, there's got to be more of a lie. So I wanted to find out more. It was transformative for me.